of organizing papers there. And I highlight on this slide on the left, the, the highly cited uh, LIGO Virgo papers. Uh, we as a collaboration are very proud of it. And on the right, I just uh, try to list our papers from the pandemic times in the, the last couple of months. Um, perhaps uh, uh, that describes how much time we have to do science. Um, so um, we, we do two kinds of research, astrophysics to, um, to learn about the beauty of the cosmos and the universe. And also we have a biophysics research line where we um, use our experimental experience and skill to make a difference uh, um, in the life of um, many on earth. Uh, from malaria to um, uh, COVID now. So you can see a COVID paper we just published on um, drug repurposing um, on the top. So on this, in this talk, I will really focus on, on, on a special um, subfield of astrophysics, uh, multi-messenger um, astrophysics with gravitational waves. So, of course, I'm happy to com uh, comment on other, other research we do, but this will be the focus of uh, 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 the talk. So, if you want to learn more about the early um, uh, years of multi-messenger effort in LIGO, then Jujo had a very nice summary in the uh, 13th issue of the LIGO magazine that is available um, on the web um, and the uh, and I highly recommend you read this, read this magazine because it actually presents not just uh, scientific uh, facts, but a lot of cultural and uh, community uh, related information. So where are we coming from? We are coming from uh, pretty much 1916. So uh, Einstein uh, predicted the existence of gravitational waves early on uh, after uh, recognizing that GR is a, is a very good theory describing our universe. And, and uh, this prediction was, was really something uh, he himself did not believe uh, testable for a long time. So, so a lot of time had to pass until we actually discover gravitational waves. It was really pretty much a century long quest with a lot of doubt and a lot of disbelief on the way. Um, I remember when uh, in the late 90s, I joined uh, LIGO um, as, a, as a fresh member at Caltech. I came from the particle physics uh, ground and everybody told me that I'm totally insane to leave perfectly good science for this craziness which will never do anything. Um, well, um, uh, we, uh, maybe a couple of hundred of us, believed that we can make it work and we can get um, uh, the Einsteinian dream um, done much before other people believe it can be done. It took a lot of, uh, lot of work and uh, it, was, uh, <laughs> um, it was 15 times longer than I wanted it to be, but uh, we succeeded at the end. So, if you look back um, uh, for the history of interferometric gravitation wave detection, you have to go back uh, to 1956, um, the uh, time of the Hungarian revolution against occupation. Um, but uh, that time, in 1956, people could only do uh, get on can experiments uh, um, with interferometric detection of gravitational waves because uh, that uh, predated the invention of the laser by four years. Um, so, so it is an old idea uh, to detect gravitational waves by, by lasers. And this was actually not the first type of gravitational wave detector built. There were many uh, wonderful uh, technological miracles like bar detectors, sphere detectors, um, uh, resonant type detectors that uh, were attempting to detect gravitational waves. Um, 
at the end, um, interferometry detect or screech the detection, but there is a rich history of other technologies beyond interferometers. So I, I, I don't uh, um, even attempt to, to, to cover that history here. So uh, the first uh, laser interferometric uh, gravitation wave detection uh, uh, was mentioned in 1963 uh, in a Soviet paper. So um, oftentimes people publishing in Russian were overlooked by, by other nations because Russians were very busy uh, translating English literatures, but, but Russian literature was rarely translated to English. So, so um, I, I just want to emphasize that, that there was a parallel universe of science there and it had a um, very interesting insight uh, well before uh, I was born. So um, uh, around the time when I was born, um, there was one experiment which did not receive uh, a big upload. Uh, it was an experiment uh, conducted in uh, Hughes Research Labs in Malibu, where people built a three meter uh, interferometer to attempt to detect gravitational waves. I, I recommend you read that early paper. Of course, uh, this uh, detector had no chance to detect gravitational waves, but um, they put together a device um, that demonstrated the principle. So it has a very strong place in history. So around uh, the same time, uh, Rainer Weiss of MIT actually pu uh, published an internal report which became public um, later on uh, with the design of an interferometer that is really the predecessor of LIGO as we know it today. And, uh, and, and really Ray persevered for nearly half a century to, to actually make this thing a reality. And uh, here is, here is uh, in the lower right corner, a, a nice uh, sketch of Ray's uh, dream. And if you look at it, it is not that much different from uh, current day LIGO. So, so uh, of course, uh, there was an uphill battle because uh, crazy things like gravitational wave detectors needed a lot of money, but uh, very few people believed that that money should be spent on, uh, on, on crazy goals like gravitational waves. So um, from 1972 uh, to 1989, a, a dedicated uh, small group of believers and uh, insiders in NSF were dreaming up uh, something that is displayed on this slide. This is artwork uh, predating uh, LIGO construction by a decade, but you can see that if you compare this dream to the reality uh, on the left, uh, they were spot on. So, so imagine that, that uh, um, visionaries uh, actually pursuing this science from, from a dream to reality for decades and decades ongoing. Uh, why did it last so long? Um, where just the vacuum system of initial LIGO, you know, what you see on these images, um, as compared to Manhattan, it's four kilometers by four kilometers. You can see it from space. Just the vacuum system cost um, uh, $175 million um, in um, 1998 dollars. So, so even the biggest nothing on earth um, uh, is very costly. And if you take a full cost accounting, probably the detection of gravitational waves, waves cost about a billion dollars, yeah? Which is a lot with scientific standards, but it is only half as much as a B2 bomber. So it's not that bad. And if you look at uh, what uh, uh, our wonderful collaboration created, uh, it's a tough detector. We survived blazing uh, um, 
fire around us, uh, flying police trying to hit the beam cube. So the $2 million is spent on um, uh, concrete protection was very well spent uh, because uh, um, the um, beam cube was uh, totally intact um, and, uh, and the car was uh, mildly hurt. So, so this wonderful detector was built um, as, uh, as a, a collaboration uh, between uh, many, many institutions worldwide, but the, the, the construction and, and many, many scientific decisions that took it from a dream to reality are really due to two brilliant minds. Left is Barry Barish, in the middle is Gary Sanders. Um, so in the middle of LIGO, um, after advanced LIGO vision was ready for construction, Barry left uh, to create something uh, uh, glorious, International Linear Collider, um, and then he returned to LIGO. Uh, Gary uh, continued after the success of um, um, initial LIGO to head the 30 meter telescope project. So uh, also displayed here uh, is uh, uh, Kip Thorn. So Kip Thorn, uh, we will come to be come back to Kip Thorn's uh, uh, brilliant uh, contribution to the history. Was really uh, giving uh, something to do to LIGO, and uh, that something to do eventually convinced everybody to build it. And now we are looking forward to an international network of gravitational wave detectors. Uh, this network is totally necessary because one gravitational wave detector sees the full sky. This means doesn't matter pretty much with a good approximation, doesn't matter where the violent cosmic event happens, we will see it. Um, however, we will not be able to point. We uh, have to use multiple uh, gravitational wave detectors with time of flight to actually construct the sky direction of the cosmic signal necessary for multi messenger astronomy because uh, we have to interface with astronomers, neutrino detectors, GRB satellites, and so on. So, so we operated for a while with the LIGO, Hanford, LIGO, Livingston, and Virgo, uh, triple observatory combinations, um, and now uh, we are adding uh, Kagra and LIGO India. Uh, I'm personally very proud because the Columbia Group uh, contributed uh, to the uh, contributed the timing system to the majority of these detectors, with the exception of Virgo, and that timing system makes it possible to point on the sky and to have low noise in the gravitational wave observatories. So coming back to Kip Thorne. Uh, Kip Thorne um, actually predicted early on, um, this graph is from 1987. I was uh, unhappily serving in a military at that year, but they already foreseen the future in gravitational waves. And if you look at all the sources they predicted, it's, it's amazing the accuracy they had foreseen what LIGO will see. So I encourage you to mull over this graph as much as you can. Um, and uh, this is a point where I have to pay tribute to one of the large uh, um, contributions, a brilliant mind, uh, Ron River. Uh, Ron started a gravitation wave uh, science in Glasgow and then he moved to Caltech, where I had the privilege to talk to him very often. He was a brilliant intuitive scientist, and, and they really tried the early LIGO-related uh, experiments with Ray and Kip and tried to, try to get funding. And uh, uh, Ron passed away, but his contributions and, and, and really uh, super brilliant thinking was, was totally critical for LIGO uh, to exist. So uh, we have uh, detectors, uh, we have um, predicted sources, 
Then we switch on the detector and up to date, we detested a lot of black holes, yeah? So in this um, graph, you see many, many black hole binaries uh, um, that uh, we detected. Of course, we have much more. Um, this plot is out of, uh, out of date, but it kind of illustrates my point. We are detecting a lot of black holes, those, those blue, um, blue circles, and we only detected one uh, really nice uh, neutron star merger. Uh, we will come back to that, but that neutron star merger really made history. That was, that was a lucky one. LIGO got lucky many times. So uh, if we go to the next slide, here is a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, um, uh, pointer. Yeah? So when you think about gravitational waves, you often think about binary black holes, binary neutron stars or a neutron star black hole in spiraling. Yeah? Most of the time people um, neglect the environment of uh, binary black holes, so they, they, they just say that, oh, there is no electromagnetic or neutrino emission from binary black holes. We will come back to that. It's not that, uh, not that sure. But if you think about it, it's pretty, uh, pretty obvious that whenever a neutron star or two neutron stars are involved in this merger, um, when you follow what's going to happen before the final black hole formation, there will be extraordinarily rich and powerful emission of electromagnetic and uh, perhaps neutrino signals. So, so when I when I was thinking about the future uh, 20 years ago, it was pretty clear to me that the future of gravitational waves will be multi-messenger astronomy. To my surprise, uh, uh, Barry Barish totally agreed with me. And to my other surprise, uh, many, many colleagues totally disagreed. So uh, fortunately, um, uh, perseverance uh, led to the uh, maturation and um, uh, development of multi messenger astronomy. And uh, this means that uh, we actually were ready when the neutron star merger happened. And today, uh, the biggest supporters of multi messenger astronomy are the people who were against it uh, in the first decade. So um, early on, I was really curious how to convince the the, the people who didn't see the future in multi-messenger astronomy, uh, but had seen the future in uh, gravitational waves only. So I came up with a definition that pioneering fields of science often have more questions than answers. That is really the definition of a pioneering field. Yeah? Um, and and uh, I published a crazy paper where most of the paper consisted of questions that we will be able to answer when multi messenger astronomy becomes a reality. And many of these questions are actually uh, uh, are answered or being answered, and many of them are still open. So, so we were and we are still a pioneering field of science. So in the next slides, I will go through some of the questions I listed in that paper a long time ago, just you to see um, uh, what were the dreams and, 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 and how we kind of proved that there is merit in multi-messenger astronomy. So, um, more questions, more questions, more questions. For example, here is with pink. What is the origin of long and short GRB? What is the precise dynamics of each GRB engine? That, that was really a totally open question. And you know, what a nice question it is in hindsight. No, we can have really long review papers on kilonovi. Kilonovi, short GRBs, yeah, are really, uh, you know, front of nature magazine. So, so each of these questions are really 
multiple physics PhDs um, when you answer them. So of course, there are many more, and of course, uh, I, I don't want to list all of them here. They are listed in the paper. Uh, my point is that, yes, we have a lot of questions, and some of them are answered, and many of them are not. So for the next generation of early career scientists, this is an amazing opportunity to get involved in science. So multi-messenger astronomy really uh, took off um, uh, when we founded it with Barry uh, 20 years ago, and uh, we, we made connection with, with all kinds of uh, data sources, and uh, we realized that uh, we have to uh, work on everything from gamma ray transients to optical neutrino, radio and x-ray transients. And it is not just correlation in time and correlation in direction, but, but uh, information on the physics and the source and the environment and the distance uh, that gives us um, much better gravitation wave detection and much richer science. We started uh, with the two strategies, the follow-up strategy where we generated triggers and then followed up our triggers with astronomical instrumentation and also uh, the extrig strategy where we took data from um, say satellites and then did a deeper, uh, more targeted search of the gravitation wave data. And recently we added one more approach uh, where uh, what we call LAMA, where we are using uh, uh, all um, um, information, gravitation wave, gamma ray, high energy neutrino, so on, in a common statistical framework. Uh, there is no hierarchy of data anymore. You know, in the extrig and follow-up strategy, there was a hierarchy of data. No, we cheat all data sources sources equivalently statistically. So it's, it's a really nice evolution how we treat multi-messenger astronomy. Um, there were many, um, many interesting multi-messenger searches in the past. I just highlight a few, a few of them. On this slide, uh, you see the Andromeda galaxy. Matter of fact, the first uh, multi-messenger observational paper was really um, from uh, 2007 uh, related to the GRBO7021 uh, that had direction consistent with the Andromeda galaxy. And uh, uh, we did very deep uh, searches for a binary uh, neutron, uh, neutron star in spiral as the gamma ray signature indicated that it's more likely a short GRB, less likely an extragalactic magnetar. And we, it, is, it was so close that LIGO detectors at the time could really exclude the possibility of binary neutron star merger in the Andromeda galaxy. So most likely it was uh, the first uh, extra galactic magnetar discovery. So even non-detection with the LIGO detectors had astrophysical impact. And, and this is really the first um, um, electromagnetic gravitation wave multi-messenger observational uh, paper. So, of course, uh, magnetars became uh, very, uh, very popular at that time with their giant flares. So we did a lot of uh, metal development and searches for magnetars, putting down the first, uh, first limits on many of the properties. Um, uh, early on uh, in the mid uh, 2000s, we really became interested in uh, the South Pole. Matter of fact, not just the South Pole, but the ice cube detector at the South Pole, because uh, many of the cosmic processes with black hole formation are except, uh, expected to emit um, um, high energy neutrinos, not just electromagnetic and gravitational wave radiation. Uh, that was really an uphill battle because theory was really immature. Um, so first uh, we, we, we proved the, the, the viability of the search ID in 2006. And then I have to emphasize this, 
then we had to engage in a decade-long um, uh, team building effort where we really um, um, organized interest and teams behind this topic yeah so this is a recurring scheme um, I, I really had to do a lot of team building in my life um, because uh, theorist and uh, theorist and experimentalist have to have to actually develop their science in unison so after we demonstrated that yes we could see high energy neutrino gravitational wave grb common emission then we had to actually convince uh, brilliant theorists uh, to actually uh, derive what kind of signature what kind of processes we can probe and that was really a beautiful development of a new field that didn't exist before and right now it's standard and we are publishing observational paper on uh, on uh, on this um, very often uh, this is the last remaining holy grail um, uh, for us uh, there was no uh, optically confirmed uh, coincidence of high energy neutrino and uh, gravitational wave yet so so this is really the frontier um, and, and you can see here that Antares detector in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean ice queen, the South Pole, Oje, um, and LIGO and Virgo are collaborating uh, very nicely. So uh, one last uh, historical uh, point I want to emphasize. Uh, this is uh, about optical detection of uh, gravitational wave counterparts. Uh, very interestingly, uh, we did uh, the first optical follow-up to gravitational waves uh, as a joint project between uh, Columbia and University of Maryland um, uh, with, uh, with the involvement of uh, undergraduates. I have to emphasize that early career scientists are extremely bright and uh, it's a total pleasure to work with them and uh, people uh, who participated in this project, became um, uh, astrophysicist. And very interestingly, the telescope we used for the early, uh, early follow-up was the Swope telescope, the very same telescope that discovered the optical counterpart for the um, neutron star, neutron star merger discovery. So somehow there is this beautiful circle of science as we do the first observation and then um, uh, um, building community and then the same telescope discovers um, the signal. So you can see here the discovery it's pretty clearly there if you compare the left and the right image and probably you couldn't actually not hear about uh, this wonderful uh, observation which was the most observed astronomical event in known human history and uh, one point I want to emphasize is this that uh, here we also work together uh, with theorists uh, this is actually a prediction from uh, uh, um, 2010 um, the red curve and then the blue um, squares are the measurements from the neutron star discovery. This is really the light curve as predicted from a kilonova uh, in 2010 when we invited Brian to give a talk on the extric telecon in LIGO. Uh, we were only hoping for multi messenger discoveries, and Brian was uh, uh, not as famous as he is now. And, uh, and nurturing, nurturing uh, interest in, uh, in, uh, in theory and experiment together to actually develop together is a very beneficial thing. I can't recommend it enough. So, so this really makes the, makes the case that um, synergies and comprehensive multi-sensory multimodal integration in astrophysics, what we call multi-messenger astrophysics, is the way to go and nowadays nobody argues with that NSF even made the National Science Foundation even made um, 
it one of the major initiatives. So uh, let me highlight uh, some of the very interesting future directions where, where, where we need more, more, more brilliance, more work, and where we can actually have a lot of science. So um, gravitational wave sky maps are kind of large, 10 to 100 square degrees. There are awful lot of galaxies in there. So what you need to do is really somehow narrow down the possibilities. So sensitive spectrographs or narrow field optical microscopes could actually follow them up. Um, who can you do that? Uh, we included galaxy maps in the 2007 paper um, as a pioneering effort, but our galaxy maps are really incomplete to distances where advanced LIGO can see uh, binary neutron star mergers. So, so completeness is an issue, and that means that um, we need better and better uh, um, galaxy catalogs. So in this paper, uh, we point out that it is possible to build a, a system from repurposed two, three meter telescopes that are plentiful on Earth that can actually map the gravitational wave signal region uh, quickly, look for galaxies that are in the error box distance wise of the gravitational wave signal, and then give those to narrow field telescopes to follow up when the kilonova is still bright and visible. So we call that a galaxy catalog on the fly. It is possible and hopefully uh, many people will implement it on uh, various telescopes to, to actually follow up gravitational wave events on a more sensitive way. So um, the next, next idea I, I would like to emphasize is that uh, while many people did not think about uh, the possibility of using a James Webb Space Telescope uh, to follow up gravitational wave events because uh, it's a very precious resource, there is a way to do it. We worked really hard. This was one of the hardest papers we ever did because JWST was not constructed for this purpose. Its slew is really intricate and slow, but um, if time is given, it can actually be an exquisite uh, kilonova hunter. Uh, what I want to emphasize for you, if you design something in the future, um, um, please design something that is, is, is faster in slew. Um, I want to emphasize the bottom line of the of this table. Yeah. So if you have um, twelve hours uh, of observation time, then you can take sixteen minutes of kilonova hunting hunting pictures. Yeah. So so sixteen minutes of pictures and 12.6 hours of slew time. Yeah? That's, that's why it's very expensive to hunt for kilonovi with JWST, although it's possible. Um, but it's actually very cheap to hunt for um, gravitational waves is Cherenkov telescopes. So there is this new worldwide network of uh, CTA, the Cherenkov telescope array that will be able to find uh, very high energy gamma photons from these uh, kilonova events. And, uh, and this is actually a great opportunity um, to do uh, pioneering science. So if you have a chance to work with CTA um, or other Cherenkov telescopes, I, I highly recommend it. They are wonderful collaborations and amazing instruments and they have a bright future. So, one more uh, interesting point. Oftentimes, um, people don't think about um, radio as a viable uh, multi-messenger source uh, because radio comes out later. 
However, because they come out later, um, they have a very interesting, uh, um, they present a very interesting opportunity. And this opportunity is really what we call radio forensics. So we collected many, many um, GRBs, uh, which are um, supposedly short GRBs uh, associated with neutron star mergers, but nobody could prove it because nobody found the optical counterparts for them. However, uh, if the neutron star neutron star merger discovery is correct, then these sources should actually emit radio, uh, peculiar radio radiation uh, for years and years after the merger. So what we have right now is a, a observation campaign with uh, a very large array uh, to look for um, um, uh, late radio signals from all the short GRB candidates uh, that had no uh, optical counterparts associated with them. So uh, we don't have results yet, at least not published, but this is a really exciting uh, project to discover other uh, neutron star mergers that were missed in the past. So um, I guess I have very little time, so I would like to highlight two more topics for your interest, and uh, then I will conclude the talk. So one of the topics we are very excited about is hier hierarchical black hole mergers in active galactic nuclei. So if you think about active galactic nuclei, you should think about a giant black hole in the middle surrounded by a dense uh, accretion disk. And uh, for dynamical reasons, when um, black holes surround the central giant uh, black hole, um, they kind of get stuck in this um, um, gas disk and uh, merge. So uh, the merger is actually described in many papers listed here, but the way you should think about it is that if you have a binary a black hole orbiting this central giant black hole, but what should happen fairly often, it will actually cross the accretion disk um, um, as it orbits the central black hole and end up getting stuck there. And according to our simulation, friction within the disk will actually lead to a very fast uh, merger and then um, um, gravitation wave emission. And beyond, beyond this binary, uh, what happens uh, in this dynamic, um, heavily, heavily, um, um, draggy environment is that black holes are actually stuck in this ring and they migrate to black hole traps where they can have hierarchical merger, namely like two black holes merge with each other and then a third one comes close, it merges with them and the fourth one and so on. So there are these hierarchical mergers. And the signature of this hierarchical merger is uh, uncharacteristically large um, end mass for the resulting black holes that we don't expect from stellar evolution and also uh, high aligned spin because the dynamics of the disk aligns the spins. So uh, we were curious whether we see any suspicious black holes in LIGO detections and indeed uh, there is one GW170729 which looks very different from the others. First of all, it has, look at the pink curve on the left side, it has uncharacteristically large, um, large mass, uh, uh, which is um, curiously getting to the outside of the stellar evolution models. And also in the same time of the large mass, it has a relatively large spin look at the violin diagram on the right hand side. So, so this thing uh, has really the large mass and the spin, what we 
what we use as a marker for, for um, hierarchical merger origin. So if you, if you look at black holes, like the card on the left side, where two black holes merge into a second generation black hole, and that merges with a first generation black hole to get a third generation black hole, then you can produce very large black hole masses and the spins are also uh, smoking, uh, um, smoking guns. And if we look at the probability density, uh, density distribution for the mass and uh, effective spin on the y-axis uh, for all the LIGO events, you see that that uh, uh, 170729 is really not compatible with the with the with the standard LIGO black hole detections, but if we compare it to AGN uh, merger hierarchical simulations, um, as a plot on the right side, you can see that the agreement is a lot better. Um, you see that the the highest probability blue region really overlaps with the with the parameter estimations for for this. Yeah. So this is a suspicious event for for um, hierarchical mergers and um, similar, um, similar results were found for uh, 1708, uh, 17A. Um, and you can see uh, at the bottom of the slide that uh, the deconstructed parameters are really um, not uh, compatible with the plain vanilla LIGO uh, detection uh, parameters. They are uh, pretty compatible with the AGM model and less compatible with the hierarchical merger without AGM. So, so definitely hierarchical merger is more compatible with this observation and AGM is more compatible a bit than uh, AGM less hierarchical merger. So um, the conclusion from, from this is that, that uh, AGNs are an interesting environment for uh, black hole uh, formation. We call that a black hole assembly line. And there are two suspicious events. So we will have to keep a, a, a open mind and, uh, and search for more in the future. Um, the other interesting uh, topic I want to highlight, this is really the, the fifth messenger, new messenger. Um, but we can actually associate with gravitational wave sources. Uh, recently, um, we uh, realized that the Kilonova model uh, is really good predicting um, the isotope um, ratio of neutron star mergers. So when uh, two neutron stars are merging, it's a very violent process, as you see in this video, um, and uh, if, you, if you see this, this uh, collision and, and matter distribution, what you realize is that, that there is awful lot of, lot of uh, neutrons flying around. They are pretty much creating all known isotopes uh, in the universe and understanding and simulating this process can lead to a very uh, nice prediction of uh, nucleosynthesis through um, uh, rapid neutron capture or R process. So what happens is that in this neutron star collision, all kinds of elements are produ uh, produced. Uh, you see that that uh, all the all the violet colored elements are produced in neutron star uh, collisions. Um, and all of these elements are radioactive. So all of them are produced really instantaneously uh, at the neutron star collision, and then they decay away. So that really means that they are like clocks which, which were set uh, at the merger time, and then they tick differently. So if we detect them in, um, in um, uh, earth rocks, uh, or sediments, we can actually see whether there was a close-by um, neutron star collision that 
uh, contributed to Earth, um, and uh, we can actually measure its distance and um, and uh, the the time of the merger. And um, um, if you look at this, uh, we found one coherent story um, that we had one neutron star merger, um, thousand light years from the uh, pre-solar nebula that formed the solar system 100 million years later. And if this kilonova would happen today, uh, that is uh, that is what you would see above the New York skyline. It would outshine all stars on the on the sky. So, so the bottom line is that there is there is a, um, a neutron star merger identified um, that happened uh, um, hundred million years before the formation of the solar system about. Uh, um, um, thousand light years away, and uh, uh, we on Earth uh, have a um, significant amount of uh, material from this singular event, uh, including uranium, gold, and even an eyelash worth of uh, material in our bodies. Um, so, this is a pretty interesting. Uh, pretty interesting consequence of neutron star collisions. It is up close at personal. This is not esoteric somewhere far away in the cosmos. So I want to project um, enthusiasm for the future, hard work and uh, great instruments um, uh, will be built. Uh, this is the dream of a 40 kilometer um, uh, future gravitation wave detector in the US. And uh, if you look at the sensitivity curves, this will be um, uh, more than an order of uh, magnitude more sensitive than current detectors. And uh, this will uh, see most of the known universe in black holes and see very far in binary neutron stars. This is pretty much the end point of known human technology. It will cost many billions of dollars, so it is not clear when it will be built, uh, but uh, the time we hope it will be built is kind of compatible with the time of the space-based gravitation wave interferometer that probes very different physics from Earth-based interferometers. And, uh, I would like to close the talk uh, showing the questions we collected a couple of years ago, what we will answer uh, in the future. So uh, with that, I made the case that there are very interesting questions. It's a pioneering science and um, you should do it. Um, thank you very much and apologies for running a little bit late. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It's not late, actually. We have time for questions. Um, uh, we have questions. My gente da Unicamp tem a prioridade. Our locals have priority, but everyone, anyone can in the queue, but anyone can ask. Um, just unmute yourself or put in chat that you raise your hand or put in chat that you'd like to ask a question and unmute yourself if you, um, if you want to, uh, if you want to ask. Or raise your hand, but it's, uh, um, uh, George, this is... Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Yes, Ernest. this is Ernesto. I'm not, I'm not finding the rising hands uh, button, but in any case... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Just I, I, have question, yeah. <laughs> I have a question that I'm, I'm even not sure if the question makes sense itself, but in any case, I'm confused about something because I'm not from the field. And let's assume 
in this multi-messenger approach that we have uh, gravitational waves being emitted at simultaneously with uh, electromagnetic radiation or even neutrinos that uh, has a very tiny mass and uh, the propagation velocity it's almost the, uh, the, the light velocity. So my question is if the oscillations in space-time uh, and can make some kind of interference in the, uh, can change the radiation and particles that are originally emitted uh, at the same time of the gravitational waves. And if this effect can be observed or not, or is a very tiny effect that can be neglected. Um, actually, this is a very rich and very good question. So first of all, we are very interested in, in um, arrival times, relative arrival times of um, uh, the messengers. Yeah? So as you say that um, there are multiple, multiple uh, versions, gravitational waves, and then neutrinos, and then photons. And uh, the relative arrival time actually can make a limit or, or make a case for um, extensions or breakdown of Einsteinian gravity, like uh, massive gravity models. Um, and also what happens is, is um, there's an uncertainty which limit the, which limit the accuracy of these methods uh, and that favors far away sources. So there is an uncertainty in the theory when when photons, neutrinos, and gravitational waves emitted, because they are really um, not emitted in the same time. You know, some of them are related to the environment, some of them to the core process. Um, so, so there is some inherent uncertainty in the in the in the source that will always limit our sensitivity. But more we understand the source, less this uncertainty will be. So there are, there are um, interesting studies about what gravitational waves do very close to the, to the um, black hole formation. Um, so very close uh, gravitational waves can be quite strong. Like when a 30 and 30 solar mass black hole pair merges, about three solar masses of energy are emitted in gravitational waves. So that's quite a bit of energy. But, but still the, the effect of, of gravitational waves uh, along the path uh, uh, to Earth is, is really minuscule. So, so um, other, other effects are, are probably more uh, more uh, disturbing uh, for the for the um, multi messenger field, like like with neutrinos. Neutrinos are actually particles. So so from the distances we see gravitational waves clearly, and we see gamma rays clearly. Uh, we expect either zero or one neutrino. So so that means that that. Uh, we have to we have to somehow distinguish that one neutrino uh, from all the other one neutrinos. Uh, curiously, if you would see two or three neutrinos from the same source, roughly the same time, that would be a glowing discovery. Uh, the the background is is so well controlled, but but usually, statistically, we don't expect more than one neutrino. So so that's a, that's an interesting case. But, but the, the crux of the matter is really the biggest uncertainty over anything is the source, understanding the source, understanding uh, who it emits, the various messengers. Because, because the, the, the various messengers actually probe different physical processes at different time and different place around these sources. So, so that is that is some kind of emission hierarchy. So, so I think I think I 
I cannot, uh, cannot emphasize more that please do think about this question. This is, this is pretty good. And there are a lot of very interesting science hidden in there. Thank you. Thanks. Igor has a question. He's written it down and I can write, I can say it, but uh, if you want to unmute yourself. Just read up. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll read it. So Igor is asking, Igor Moll is asking, um, is, is asking, will there be a possibility of testing gravitational theories with extra space-time dimensions? Also in massive gravity theories, gravitons have five degrees of polarization. Will be, there be a possibility to test how many polarizations do gravitons have in, in gravity waves? Also a good question with, with, uh, with pretty open answer. So, so what happens is that right now um, our network is, is incomplete. Yeah? So we, we have uh, many, many parameters and we have um, very few detectors. So, so what happens is that we have to marginalize over many parameters because uh, the detectors are really um, few and far between. So, so most of the LIGO detections are made by, by um, two or three uh, gravitation wave detectors, sometimes with a single one. So, so we are barely able to have nice sky maps at this point. To, to have more information that is necessary to, to answer um, um, uh, more in-depth questions about polarizations, um, we will need uh, many more detectors. And that's why it's really, um, really great that, that two more detectors will be coming online in the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, and, and those will have enough um, redundant data um, for a, a quintuple detection to, to, to actually go beyond the, 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 the already overwhelming set of parameters. That, that doesn't actually mean um, that, that we can't probe alternative gravity models. And there are probably clever ways to do it. I know that, that people are, are regularly um, looking at uh, things like um, uh, propagation speed um, or, or ring down um, signal um, as, as, as probing alternative or, or, or massive gravity models. Um, so, so we are doing whatever we can, but I think clever ideas how to do other investigations are, are there is a range for them. You know, I don't think we are doing a comprehensive study. So, um, exactly. yes. Just in particular, I mean, because this is actually something I'm curious about as well. Is there experimental evidence that, that the gravity wave has two polarizations and two polarizations only? Um, um, I think the first statement has, yeah, we, we see them. Yeah, so, so I don't, I'm not aware of any paper, uh, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, where, where more uh, polarizations were probed and excluded. I know that some people were searching for um, monopole and dipole gravitational waves in the past. Yeah, um, so, so, so less polarizations they were um, trying to do. Uh, LIGO is not very sensitive, obviously, for those polarizations. But uh, uh, I'm not aware of, 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 of uh, excluding them, yeah? So I think the best source, if you want to see the, the most advanced thinking of LIGO on non-GR, is uh, is Chris Van den Broek, 
in um, the Netherlands. He is the he is the lead of the of the um, anything beyond GR group, and uh, and I think uh, he can give a much more um, a concrete answer to that. I, I just I just say I I had not seen any any higher polarizations. Um, I will send you his contact info. Or I can put you into contact with him if you are interested. I, I would really like you to uh, talk to him. He is a very nice person. Any more questions? Anyone? Um, if not, last chance. May I ask a question from the audience? Um, Please. <laughs> what, what stops you from uh, collaborating with LIGO or Virgo? Uh, um, you should have a group uh, who, is, who is doing gravitational waves. So, I believe that there is one person in the audience, or there was, who is doing, who is. Yes, I am here. Ah. Uh, I am here. I'm Carola. I, uh, I work in the Pierre Roger collaboration and awesome. we were looking for many coincidences with your detections, but unfortunately we have found none. But okay. not gravitational waves in cosmic ray physics. But, <laughs> yes, but uh, you, should, you should keep it up because um, uh, most of our detections are black holes. So what we expect is, is the multi-messenger signature is really coming from the environment. Um, so it's, it's probably weak and, and probably uh, kind of um, over, over um, shadowed by the distribution, the, the emission of the background, the, the environment itself. So, um, uh, when we see more and more neutron star mergers, uh, I think it will become a lot more, a uh, lot more uh, fruitful and interesting. Yeah, because right now, right now these are black holes. Um, part of my ignorance about people who work literally in front of me, Carola, but Anderson is a member of a gravitational wave collaboration, no? Anderson is also here, is also yeah. listening to your talk. Yeah, he was in the audience, I think he... Anderson, are you around? I think he left. He was here, I mean, that's why... Okay. Great, so, so, yeah. so you, are, you are in the business, so... The, next, the, you need a gravitational wave detector in Brazil. Oh... <laughs> Well, well, why not? Yeah. Why not? It's true. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. It took $1 billion to actually um, discover, but if you want to replicate a detector from the design, it is $80 million. Yeah. So, so it's, you know, replicating one is a lot easier than developing one. So sure. this is actually what India is doing. They are they are really replicating uh, one, and uh, they are they are sending a lot of brilliant uh, early career scientists to the LIGO detectors to learn the field, and they are they are amazing. So so um, I think I think the entry to the field um, there is no no barrier than it was before. So it is possible. And if you look at, um, actually South America is, is really at the right place for the network, yeah? Because it makes triangles which are um, complementary to all other triangles which exist on Earth. Mm. I have so, to mention, that yeah. we had uh, Anderson, that was mentioned before. Uh, he was a collaborator of a Brazilian gravitation antenna. It was a spherical antenna 
and operated from, I don't remember, but uh, from almost 10 years, something like that. And people that uh, work in this Brazilian gravitational uh, detector is now working on LIGO as well. Awesome. I, I think those spherical detectors were um, amazing technologically. Um, and uh, I, I, I kind of, uh, I kind, I, I'm, I'm a little bit sad that that the success of interplanetary detectors really um, ended their reign because um, I could imagine uh, uses for the technology um, in unison with uh, with uh, interplanetary detectors at high frequencies. So, so um, that is also a very interesting point that. Um, so if you want to measure the equation of state of a neutron star, the, the signal which gives you the best uh, clue uh, is uh, at uh, 2 to 4 kilohertz, uh, where current uh, gravitational wave detectors are not sensitive. For technical reasons, you have to choose between seeing the low frequency region and more black holes, or or giving up the low frequency region and seeing more signal at the high frequency region. So, so if somebody could come up with a way to make a complementary detector that, that can observe the, the, the above two kilohertz region more sensitively than, um, than current LIGO and Virgo and Cogra detectors, that's that's a very interesting place to be scientifically, because because the 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 signals present there will really probe the the equation of state of the of the neutron stars. So so there are there are very interesting questions that that kind of point beyond the technology we are using today. So. So I know that Australians were having um, some um, uh, get on can experiments with some design to have interferometers for the, for the high frequency region. And I think Japanese colleagues also thought about it, but um, it doesn't look like that their financial power will um, allow them to build a, either a second detector like in Japan or or the first detector in, in Australia. So, so there are interesting questions open. Um, so Igor has, Igor has two more actually questions before we, so okay. one is sort of semi-theoretic, observing deviation. Is it, I mean, would it be possible to observe deviations from quasi normal modes of two black holes which uh, coalesce? Um, this is question number one, and this question number two is, is there any hope for something like the old-fashioned Weber bar to work using new materials or cooling techniques? So, so I kind of alluded for the, for the second question, is that people who are expert in resonant detectors, bar or sphere, uh, maybe, maybe could think about uh, um, the higher frequency region and, and perhaps come up with new, new tricks because, um, you know, uh, 20, 30 years uh, could have brought uh, technological possibilities, say interferometric readout to the resonant bar or, or different materials. And, and uh, even though their, their sensitivity is narrow band, if that narrow band is at the right place, uh, there could be a lot of science there. So um, I can't, I'm not expert of the resonant detectors, so I can't tell whether, whether it's possible to, to get down below advanced LIGO sensitivity at those high frequencies, or there are some fundamental physics limits. I think, I think that is really uh, for, the, for the bar experts. And um, black holes actually, um, the, the ring down, ring down part of the signal is, is, 
is not very good for the black holes what we see so um, to to have to have a higher fidelity detection uh, we would need um, a lucky lucky um, few signals that are very close by or we have to wait for um, future detectors to have less noise and higher fidelity in the in the um, merger and ring down phases of the merger so so um, we can get lucky or we can work hard and go uh, for a for a more sensitive detector i know we will have a more sensitive detector within a year but that is really like order of hector of two or or few so it's not like an order of magnitude um so so i i'm really curious about uh, what will what will we see when when we see the 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 merger and ring dome part of the of the black hole signals with high fidelity. Okay, if there is any more, if there is no more questions, uh, Zavi, thank you very, very, very much. It was a great talk. And I, yes, I, I thank you for uh, listening, and uh, and hopefully I could excite you, and uh, and maybe maybe and maybe come here be more physically. Interest. Next time you are in Brazil, please come here. <laughs> yes, uh, I would like to because I have never been around you. So, so that's a really different place where I had been before. So I would love to. And uh, I always go to biology and insect institutes. So not astrophysics. I haven't seen any astrophysics institute in Brazil. So <laughs> looking forward to. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you the Enjoy the one. evening. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. you very much. Thank you.